On this week's episode of Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast, Tesla held its quarterly earnings call where we heard about the Model 2.5, the RoboTaxi, the Next Gen Roadster, and the Tesla Semi. As always, I've got expert analysis, highlight clips from Elon Musk and the Tesla executive team, and more. What's happening, friends? I'm Ryan McCaffrey, joining you, as always, for your weekly dose of Tesla topics and news here on Ride the Lightning, the weekly Tesla unofficial podcast. This one is episode 482, publishing on October 27th, 2024. My loyal canine companion, Daisy the Boxer, to my left here. And as expected, with the earnings call, it was another very, very busy week of Tesla news. It seems like every week, matches that description lately, but that's good news for me, the guy doing a podcast about this stuff every week. I love it when it's busy. Uh, I will start here this week before I get to the earnings call and the shareholder letter details. Another week, another tweak to Tesla's incentives here in Q4 to try and move as many cars as they can, pulling and pushing various demand levers. First, there's a little bit of bad news on the incentive front. Tesla has lowered the referral slash loyalty discount on the Model 3 and on the Model Y from $1,000 to $500. Still nice, don't get me wrong, only half as nice. 500, I guess, you know, that'll cover a wall charger, the Tesla wall connector, if you don't already have one in in your garage or don't have a charger of any kind. So it's something, certainly better than nothing, but 500 now down from 1,000. However, the referral discount remains $1,000 on the Model S and the Model X. And here's some good news. There is now a $1,000 referral discount or $1,000 loyalty discount for you existing Tesla owners on the Cybertruck. Yes, the Cybertruck is getting its first, actually its second incentive. Its first incentive was the one that I'm going to tell you about next, which happened a little earlier in the week which is about FSD, we'll get to that in a second. But uh, just a reminder, if you are a first time Tesla buyer and you wanna take advantage of any of these incentives, you have to order with a referral link. If you'd like to use mine, it's ts.la slash Ryan73014. You just type that into a browser on either your desktop or mobile device, hit that, and then it'll take you to a landing page where you can choose which Tesla you'd like to order, configure it to your liking, order it, and that either $500 or $1,000 discount will be baked in. In fact, congratulations to listener Jonathan Pufall. Jonathan, I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. On your new Model Y, Jonathan ordered and took delivery with my referral link this past week. So next... The other thing, the first actual incentive on the Cybertruck, because it happened sooner, which was FSD. So eagle-eyed Tesla tipster Sawyer Merritt posted on X this past week after seeing that the Cybertruck is now eligible for free FSD transfer until the end of 2024. The Cybertruck, as you know, wasn't eligible before, but Tesla changed those rules. So... If you currently own an S3, X, or Y and would like to buy a Cybertruck and transfer your FSD to that, you can now do so provided you take delivery by December 31st. And it is definitely surprising that the Cybertruck is getting not one but two incentives this early into general production. And it really, I think, comes back to the lack of that $7,500 right off the top, out the door, individual tax credit. So far, so far the Cybertruck is not eligible for that. It just seems to be causing a ton of people to hold off and understandably so, and thus making it a little bit tougher for Tesla to get people to jump in at $80,000 on the Cybertruck. Next up, more incentives, let's keep talking. Tesla has revised its financing terms. 
You still need to be a quote unquote well qualified buyer by Tesla's definition to get 0% APR, but it's no longer tied to FSD. You don't have to buy FSD in order to get the 0% APR financing provided again, you're a quote unquote well qualified buyer. Here's how it now breaks down. On the Model Y, it's quite generous. If your loan is 36 to 60 months, th those are the ones that'll be eligible for a 0% APR loan. If you're going six years, 72 months, it's still pretty nice, a 0.99% APR, and 84 months is a 2.99% APR. It's different on the Model 3. So there, the only way to get 0% APR, and by the way, all of this requires a 20% down payment to get that 0%, but on the Model 3, it's only a 36 month loan term that'll get you the 0%. 48 months, if you go that route, 0.99%. 60 months is 1.99%, 72 is 2.99, and 84 months is a 4.99% APR. Still better, I think, than pretty much any bank or traditional financing method you're gonna get. So Tesla is offering pretty impressive in-house financing rates on this. And as you can clearly tell there, they are being more aggressive on the Model Y. And I imagine that's for two reasons. One, they know they can move more of them than any other car they sell. It is the number one selling car in the world for a reason. So getting aggressive on the Y specifically can really move the needle more than the Model 3 can. Not that the Model 3 can't, but the Y is gonna move that needle further. And then the second reason I imagine that they're getting more aggressive on the Model Y than the Model 3 is that those in the know, read all of you, are fully aware that the Model Y refresh, codenamed Project Juniper, is coming next year and presumably early next year, although we're not quite as certain on the exact timing there. So this aggressive financing offer is no doubt a, a pretty nice attempt, if I'm being honest here on Tesla's part, to lure those fence sitters that are hanging back, waiting for Juniper to maybe go ahead and jump into a great deal right now. And finally, uh, Sawyer also noted this past week that there are some serious discounts on inventory Model Ys and Model 3s. And it's vital to note that these are not demo cars. There are demo cars in the inventory section of the Tesla website, but not all of them are demo cars. So nobody's driven them, nobody's abused them, and you can get up to $4,000 off plus another $500 if you use someone's referral link, whether it's mine or somebody else's. In fact, if you go to my referral link or somebody's referral link, you'll see it's Y3SX Cybertruck and then inventory. So you can click inventory to see what's in there. Now, uh, I do have to add as well, a friend of mine, by sheer coincidence, his car... I don't want to say died because it's not like it's completely unfixable, but he called me. He said, my car crapped out. I've, I was thinking about waiting for the model, the refresh, the Juniper next year, like you told me about. But, you know, what, what do you think? And I just, I gave him, I just gave him the options. I said, well, not quite sure when Juniper's coming out, but to get an idea of it, when you're in the showroom, test, test driving the Model Y, which I very much encourage you to do, just look at a Model 3, look inside it, and that's probably what the interior of the Juniper is gonna look very much like. But uh, I told him about these, these uh, good loan terms, and then I mentioned the inventory discounts that started this week, except that when I actually went to the inventory page and put in my zip code, which is also my friend's zip code, nothing came up. So I think those inventory discounted cars are getting gobbled up pretty quickly. But if that is of interest to you, if, if you wanna try and capitalize on an inventory discount, maybe you're not as picky with your color or your various options on the car, 
You could definitely, I, my recommendation would be to check every day, maybe even multiple times a day. Because anytime that one of these discounted inventory cars is being added into the inventory, it's they're clearly getting gobbled up pretty quickly. So there are some good deals to be had out there between now and the, uh, the rest of the year. Um, check back next week, by the way, to see if Tesla's tweaked anything else, because it seems like week by week, that's what's going on. Uh, maybe Tesla could bring back lifetime supercharging transfer for those of us that still have a car with lifetime supercharging. I do think if that ever happened, by the way, if they, they did decide to pull that demand lever, you're probably never going to be able to transfer free lifetime supercharging to a Cybertruck for one reason, the power share feature. Imagine having free lifetime supercharging on a Cybertruck. That is ripe for abuse because you could just go juice up. You could fill up your 123 kilowatt hour battery in your Cybertruck every week at the supercharger and then use your truck to power your house and power all kinds of other stuff even your other Teslas that don't have free supercharging on them. So I would not expect Cybertruck to ever be, uh, qu to ever qualify for free lifetime supercharging transfer. But it, it, that, that did, it made me laugh when I thought about, when I had to think that out, like, oh yeah, that's never going to happen probably. Okay, uh, one other warm up this week, and I promise you this is worth a couple of minutes to hear about. It is a really, really cool update from Max. Dezeger. Max, I hope I've pronounced your last name correctly there. Max is on the Tesla supercharging team, and I think he might listen to the podcast because he follows me on X. He posted on X about a new supercharging project that Tesla has in the works, and I wanted to tell you about it because it sounds pretty awesome. He says, as we continue to expand, we are breaking ground today on the latest project along this corridor. And He's referencing the Interstate 5 corridor that goes between San Francisco and Los Angeles. Obviously, there are uh, a ton of Teslas are on that route all the time. So Max writes, 168 stall supercharger. It's in Lost Hills, California. He notes, only 1.5 megawatts of grid service ahead of a future expansion. 11 megawatts of ground-mounted solar and canopies on 30 acres of land, 10 Tesla mega packs with 39 megawatt hours of storage. He says this project embodies the Tesla charging DNA, accelerating EV adoption through dependable freedom to travel, providing charging needs through determination and innovation. We can't wait to open this site by mid-2025. When you stop by, you'll be powered up by locally generated sunshine. Thank you, Max. Thank you to the entire Tesla supercharging team. 168 stalls, all of which are solar generated. How cool is that? And from the render that they included in the post that, that Max posted with, with the article there, it looks like there will be restroom facilities at this one as well, so that's always appreciated. Now, for fellow Californians out there who might be wondering specifically where this is along the supercharger-tastic Interstate 5 stretch, it is a little closer to LA than San Francisco. So to, to give context in supercharger terms, it's between the famous Kettleman City supercharger to the north, of, of Lost Hills, of this new one. So it's between Kettleman City to the north and Button Willow to the south. And I just cannot wait to check this one out after it's completed next year. This is, this is gonna be a sight to see. Okay, there is a ton to dig into in the shareholder letter and the earnings call, but a couple of quick PSAs before I get to that. First of all, just repeating what I, I first mentioned last week, for Patreon, Apple is going to be requiring that Patreon use Apple's in-app purchasing system and remove all other billing systems from the Patreon iOS app by November of 2024. So long story short, 
If you feel kind enough to join my Patreon and support the podcast, pretty much from now onwards, I would recommend not signing up through the Patreon app. Just go to the website. Just go to patreon.com slash Podcast and sign up. It, it can be on your mobile device. Just don't use the Patreon app. Otherwise, you're going to be subject to Apple's 30% App Store fee. So I'd love for you to join the Patreon. I've got ad-free episodes at all tiers. All tiers get early access to each week's show. And at that $10 per month tier, you'll get that stuff plus the weekly lightning round bonus mini episodes as well. So again, you can find all the information if you're interested in checking that out. If you'd like to support the podcast, I'd be humbled and grateful if you considered that. Go to patreon.com slash Podcast. This week's lightning round, by the way, I released, I recorded and released before the earnings call, and the topic was the seven questions that I would have asked on the earnings call if the microphone had been in my hands this week. I, I, I may humbly say I, I think I had some good ones that I wish could have gotten asked. So there's 117 of those up there now, so plenty of extra content if you are generous enough to support me on Patreon at that $10 per month tier or higher. And last thing before the shareholder letter and earnings call analysis and highlights here, there wasn't a good organic place to mention the Patreon poll results this week, so I'll just do it right here. Again, I posted the Patreon poll, which is free to anybody. You don't have to be supporting me on Patreon. Anybody can vote. In fact, I think I got more votes this week than ever. This is trending upwards. More and more people are participating in this, which I appreciate, because it is free. Just... Every week, stop by patreon.com slash Podcast, and you'll see the weekly poll question. It typically goes up on Tuesday evenings. So this one, again, posted before the earnings call when we didn't know exactly what we'd hear about. And the poll question was simply, which upcoming Tesla product are you most interested in? Not necessarily the one that you want to buy, just literally the one you're most interested in. And some pretty fascinating results here, I think. The winning vote went to the Model 2.5, as I've been calling it, aka the $25,000 car. That got 32% of the vote. Very close behind it, at 30% of the vote, was Project Juniper, aka the refreshed Model Y. And then not too far behind that, at 23%, was Optimus. Then we see a big drop-off to the next one, which is the Next Gen Roadster, 9%. I would have voted with that one uh, on that one with you guys. Just 2% say the RoboVan, and just 3% said the CyberCab, the RoboTaxi. So that's a little bit surprising, but you guys want to know about the upcoming affordable stuff. That's the near-term, interesting, affordable stuff, and I don't blame you. That is... That is uh, perfectly valid. So the good news is that you did. we did get to hear about the Model 2.5 a bit on the earnings call, which I'll get to very shortly. Actually, by the way, I wanted to shout out a longtime Patreon backer, Jared Brown, who was left, a bunch of people left great comments on this Patreon poll. And Jared said, oh, I, I wish FSD unsupervised would have been one of the choices because I would have voted for that. And you know what? Yeah, that's... That's a Tesla product that's in development, that's upcoming. And I totally should have included that. That was an oversight. Thank you for shouting that one out, Jared. Okay, I start, as always, with the shareholder letter. And I'll mention, those of you that that keep an eye on the Tesla stock may have noted this as well. Wall Street was very, very happy with the results. And I mention it because... It just seems very rare that Wall Street is happy with Tesla's earnings results, no matter how good they are. So the immediate after-hours stock price on Wednesday was way up. It was over 10%. It went from $213, which is where it closed that day, to $239 after-hours. That carried through into the next morning, Thursday of trading, and it closed for the week at the end of day Friday it kept going up $269.19. So a pretty substantial bump by the Tesla stock this week. Wall Street very, very pleased 
with the results. Okay, I will start by reading you to the Tesla summary that starts the shareholder letter. It reads, we delivered strong results in Q3 with growth in vehicle deliveries, both sequentially and year on year, resulting in record third quarter volumes. We also recognized our second highest quarter of regulatory credit revenues as other OEMs are still behind on meeting emissions requirements. Our cost of goods sold, AKA COGS, per vehicle came down to its lowest level ever at about $35,100. In order to continue accelerating the world's transition to sustainable energy, we need to make EVs affordable for everyone, including making total cost of ownership per mile competitive with all forms of transportation. Preparations remain underway for our offering of new vehicles, including more affordable models, which we will begin launching in the first half of 2025. At our We Robot event on October 10th, we detailed our long-term goal of offering autonomous transport with cost per mile below rideshare, personal car ownership, and even public transit. The energy business achieved another strong quarter with a record gross margin. Additionally, the mega factory in Lathrop pr produced 200 mega packs in a week. And additionally, or excuse me, and Powerwall deployments reached a record for the second quarter in a row as we continue to ramp Powerwall 3. Despite sustained macroeconomic headwinds and others pulling back on EV investments, we remain focused on expanding our vehicle and energy product lineup, reducing costs, and making critical investments in AI projects and production capacity. We believe these efforts will allow us to capitalize on the ongoing transition in the transportation and energy sectors. Well, Tesla's cogs going down, it's going to keep happening. That is going to continue as a trend line over the next year as that Model 2.5 enters the picture. And I know that some fudsters out there might point to the ZEV credits at the literal expense of other car companies as, well, that's the way, only way that Tesla's making money is they're because of those credits. Well, guess what? It's not the only way Tesla's making money. Even without the ZEV credits, Tesla would still be making plenty of money. But Tesla's just playing by the rules of the game. And they get to benefit because nobody else is choosing to. Other car companies could benefit from those ZEV credits if they just start building more EVs and selling more EVs. Next, as I buzz through the shareholder letter before we get to the main event, the earnings call, as I always like to update every, every time there's an earnings, uh, a shareholder letter. So how big is Tesla's Scrooge McDuck silo full of gold coins this quarter? Well, here's the answer straight from the shareholder letter. Quarter end cash, cash equivalents and investments in Q3 was $33.6 billion. The sequential increase of $2.9 billion was primarily the result of positive free cash flow of $2.7 billion. Next, we go to my favorite page of the shareholder letter each quarter. It's the vehicle capacity page, where Tesla has some notes. They say, production and delivery volumes both returned to year-on-year -year growth in Q3. We also produced our 7 millionth vehicle on October 22nd. We continued to add to our vehicle lineup by expanding the options for new vehicle trims and paint for Model 3 and Model Y. So I think the highlight there is clearly that milestone number. 7 million vehicles all time achieved just this past week. Again, I know I, there's just not much more I can say besides congratulations to the Tesla team past and present. Because there have been a lot of people that have that have come through Tesla's doors and maybe they're not working there anymore, but so many people have contributed to that. I mean, if you go back, like just go back, not even all the way to the beginning, go back to when I started this podcast nine years ago, August of 2015, the Model X hadn't launched yet. Tesla had built and 
sold and stopped selling the original Roadster, which there were 2,400 something of made. And they were making, at the time, well, 2015, they would probably been around, I don't have the number in front of me, but 30, 40, maybe 50,000 Model S's. So that's how, about how many cars they were making a year because that was the only car they were making and selling. And to go from that, nine years ago when I started doing this podcast, to now producing their seven millionth vehicle, just awesome. That is so cool. Also from the vehicle capacity page, we go to the USA entry that includes, of course, California, Nevada, and Texas, where Tesla says, refreshed Model 3 ramp continued successfully in Q3 with higher total production and lower cost of goods sold quarter over quarter. Cybertruck production increased sequentially and achieved a positive gross margin for the first time. Preparation of the semi-factory continues and remains on track with builds scheduled to start by the end of 2025. So the highlight there, Cybertruck becoming profitable ahead of schedule. Remember, just a quarter ago on the last earnings call, Tesla had told us that they were tracking towards the Cybertruck becoming profitable on a per unit basis here, not the entire program, but on a per unit basis by the end of the year. Well, they got there three months early, which is really impressive. That's quite an achievement. Very, very cool news there for both Tesla fans and shareholders alike. I mean, they they probably know that they're likely going to need the, to cut the price sooner than they may have originally projected if the $7,500 point of sale tax credit for individual buyers does not come through on the Cybertruck for whatever reason. So this would be a big step towards that, meaning Tesla achieving that per unit profitability on Cybertruck three months early will will only help them be able to successfully cut the, the, the list price of the truck sooner rather than later. Uh, also on this page, no change in the current installed annual vehicle production capacity chart. The Tesla Semi still shows as pilot production. The next gen platform and also Roadster still show as in development. Next in the battery drivetrain, uh, excuse me, battery powertrain and manufacturing section, Tesla writes, in October, we unveiled our Cybercab and RoboVan vehicles, both designed from the ground up for autonomy without a steering wheel or pedals. Cybercab will be built on our next generation platform, which includes a new powertrain with an estimated 5.5 miles per kilowatt hour. This will be our most efficient powertrain yet. In Q3, we produced our 100 millionth 4680 cell and continued to progress our dry cathode manufacturing lines. So if Cybercab, whenever it comes out, because I know, I think I said on last week's show and a number of you, a little skeptical that it's going to be available in 2026, not so much for the hardware side, but the software side and the, maybe the regulatory side, but if Cybercab, whenever it comes out, hits 5.5 kilowatt hours per mile, dare I call that a breakthrough? I mean, that's, that's a huge number. That would allow for a much smaller battery pack on that fairly small car, which in turn makes the car lighter and in turn makes the car more efficient and it just continues to feed itself. That's just a positive feedback loop for that car if they're hitting 5.5 kilowatt hours per mile, that is truly impressive. And from the last page, the Outlook page, under volume, Tesla says, our company is currently between two major growth waves. The first one began with the global expansion of the Model 3 and Y platform, and we believe the next one will be initiated by advances in autonomy and introduction of new products including those built on our next generation vehicle platform. Despite ongoing macroeconomic conditions, we expect to achieve slight growth in vehicle deliveries in 2024. Energy storage deployments are expected to more than double year over year 
in 2024. Well, I think we've probably got two more quarters, meaning this one, Q4, and Q1 of 2025 before the Model 2.5 really starts heating up. And the unveiling for that, I think, is if I were to guess, just based on Tesla's own stated timeline here, my guess is the unveiling would be likely to happen in late Q1, like late March, maybe early Q2, because it does seem like Tesla's taking my very amateur advice that's totally obvious anyway <laughs> about holding off on the unveiling of that car as long as they possibly can. So we'll see how the next two quarters go for Tesla before that next big growth wave approaches. And then the last piece of the shareholder letter that I want to talk about before I get to that earnings call is under product outlook, where Tesla says, Plans for new vehicles, including more affordable models, remain on track for start of production in the first half of 2025. These vehicles will utilize aspects of the next generation platform, as well as aspects of our current platforms, and will be able to be produced on the same manufacturing lines as our current vehicle lineup. This approach will result in achieving less cost reduction than previously expected, but enables us to prudently grow our vehicle volumes in a more capex efficient manner during uncertain times. This should help us fully utilize our current expected maximum capacity of close to 3 million vehicles, enabling more than 50% growth over 2023 production before investing in new manufacturing lines. Our purpose-built RoboTaxi product will continue to pursue a revolutionary unboxed manufacturing strategy. So yes, by the way, if your ears perked up earlier, you heard it correctly, and you heard it again here, next generation vehicles, plural. I will talk more about that in a little while. But for those who weren't sure, this section does confirm that the Model 2.5 will use existing manufacturing lines and the RoboTaxi will be the all new tech, the new unboxed strategy. So they are gonna be completely different platforms, the 2.5 and the CyberCab. Hey, this week's Ride the Lightning is brought to you as usual by my friends at Accelerate Auto and their Xcare extended warranty coverage option for the whole car, for just the battery and powertrain, for both, whatever you wanna do, it is there for you. The flexibility is the point. Go to accelerateauto.com slash xcare. That's X-C-E-L-E-R-A-T-E-A-U-T-O dot com slash X-C-A-R-E. And you can just play around, find whatever option works best for you. I've got a three-year, 40,000-mile additional extended warranty on my car, my factory warranty expired a year plus ago, almost a year and a half ago. And so I'm very, very pleased and relieved to have that extra coverage just in case I need it over the next couple of years now. If you'd like to do the same, you can go up to 10 years and up to 125,000 extra miles or scale it down. Just find the sweet spot that works for you. Accelerateauto.com slash Xcare. Don't forget the discount code LIGHTNING to get $100 off your purchase. Apologies that this is not valid in Florida. It's a weird state law thing, but $100 off for everybody else with that discount code LIGHTNING. Okay, here we go. The main event, the Q3 2024 earnings call. Now, as all of you know, if you've been listening for a while and you've heard some of these earnings call shows I've done before, you know that I always like to play Elon Musk's intro that he starts the call with. Well, this one is a little tricky, and I, I had to think about it because it is 21 minutes long, which I'm pretty sure is the longest opening remarks that Elon has ever given on an earnings call. I mean, heck, for a little bit of context, this is longer than his We Robot presentation a couple weeks ago at the RoboTaxi unveiling. So. If you don't wanna to listen to the whole thing, fast forward 21 minutes from right now, and you will get to 
the part where I'm picking out the things that I want to talk about and, and analyze. So if you've got the time, I do think it's worth listening to this because in my humble opinion, he it just covers a lot of ground. So here you go, Elon's 21-minute opening remarks. Elon, oh, thank you. Uh, so to recap, as uh, someone's saying, um, uh, it's something that what about industry are seeing year over year declines in order volumes in Q3. Uh, Tesla at the same time has achieved uh, record deliveries. In fact, I think if you look at uh, EV companies uh, worldwide, to the best of my knowledge, no EV company is even profitable. And, and, and I'm not, I, to the best of my knowledge, there is no EV division of any company, uh, of any existing auto company that is profitable. So it is notable that Tesla is profitable despite uh, a very challenging one mode of environment. Um, and, uh, and, and this quarter actually uh, is a record Q3 for us. Um, so we produced our seventh million vehicle actually just yesterday. So congratulations to the teams that made it happen in Tesla. That's the staggeringly immense amount of work <laughs> to make seven million cars. Um, so uh, let's see, uh, and, we, and we also have the energy storage business is um, growing like wildfire uh, with strong demand for both Mega Pack and Powerwall. Um, and as people know, um, on October 10th, we laid out a vision for an autonomous and electric future that I think is very compelling. Uh, also, you know, the, the Tesla team did a phenomenal job there with um, it actually giving people an opportunity to experience the future. Uh, where, where you have humanoid robots walking among the crowd, not not you know with a canned video presentation or anything, but literally walking among the crowd, serving drinks and whatnot, and um, and we had 50 autonomous vehicles. There were, there were 20 cyber cabs, but there were an additional 30 Model Ys operating fully autonomously the entire night, uh, carrying thousands thousands of people, thousands of people, drink, um, with with no incidents the entire night. Um, so, uh, and, and for those who went there, that I, it's, it's worth emphasizing that these, the cyber cab had no steering wheel or brake or accelerator pedals, meaning there was no, there's no possible, no, there was no way for anyone to intervene manually, even if they wanted to, um, and the whole night went very smoothly. So, um, regarding the vehicle business, we are still on track to deliver a more affordable uh, models starting in the first half of 2025. Um, you know, the, the, this is, I, I think probably people are wondering, well, what should they assume for vehicle uh, vehicle sales growth next year? I, and I, I, at, at the risk of, to, to take a bit of risk here, I, I, I do want to give some some rough estimate, which is I think 20 to 30 percent vehicle growth next year. Um, you know, notwithstanding negative external events, like if there's some force majeure events, like some big war breaks out or interest rates go sky high or something like that, then, you know, we, we, we can't overcome massive force majeure events. But I, I think with our lower cost vehicles, uh, with the advent of autonomy, something like a 20 to 30 percent growth next year is is uh, my best guess. Um, and, uh, and then and then cyber cap reaching volume production in 26. We do feel confident of CyberCab reaching volume production in 26, not just starting production, but reaching volume production in 26. Um, and that, uh, you know, that, that that should be substantial growth. We, we're, I mean, we're aiming for you know, at least 2 million units a year of, of CyberCab. Um, that, that'll be in more than one factory, but I think it's at least 2 million units a year, maybe 4 million ultimately. Um, so, uh, yeah, these are just my best guesses, but if you ask me what my best guess is, that's the, the, those are my best guesses. Um, the, uh, the, 46, the, the, the cell 4680 lines, the team is actually doing great work there. Um, the 4680 is uh, rapidly approaching the point where it is the most competitive cell. So when you consider the, the, fully, the fully landed, the, the cost of a, of a battery pack, um, fully landed in the U.S. net of incentives and duties uh, 
the 4680 is tracking to be the most competitive, uh, meaning lower cost per kilowatt hour fully considered than any other alternative, which is uh, we're not quite there yet, but we're we're close to being there, which I think is uh, extremely exciting. And we've got um, several, a lot of ideas to go well beyond that. So if, if I, I think there's, if we execute well, the 4680 will have the, the Tesla internally produced cell will be the most cost competitive uh, cell in, in certainly in North America. Um, a testament to a tremendous amount of hard work there from by the team. So um, that, that's a rule. We'll continue to buy a lot of cells from our competitors. Our intent is not to make to, to provide to, to make cells just internally. So I don't want to set off any alarm bells here. Uh, we're, we're obviously increasing uh, substantially our vehicle output and our stationary storage output. So we need a lot of cells. Um, and most of them will still come from suppliers, but I, but I think it is it is a, some good news that the Tesla internal cell um, is likely is tracking to be the most competitive in, in the US. So with respect to autonomy, um, as people have, are experiencing in the cars um, really from week to week, uh, there are significant improvements in the, the miles between interventions. Um, so with the, the new version 12.5, uh, the release of full self-driving and Cybertruck, the, the, the combining the code into a single stack so that the uh, city driving and the engine and highway driving are, are one stack, uh, which is a, a big improvement for the highway driving. So it's, it's, it's just all neural nets. Uh, and the release of uh, actually smart summon. <laughs> um, we try to have a sense of humor here at Tesla. Uh, and, and we're also, so that, that's 12.5. Uh, version 13 of FSD uh, is going out soon. Um, Ashok will elaborate more on that uh, later in the call. Um, and we, we expect to see some, roughly a five or six fold improvement in miles between interventions compared to 12.5. Um, and actually looking at the, the year as a whole, uh, the improvement uh, in miles between interventions, we think will be at least three orders of magnitude. So um, that's, that's a very dramatic uh, improvement uh, in the course of the year. And, uh, and we expect that trend to continue next year. So, um, so the, 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 current, the current internal expectation, the emphasized internal expectation for uh, the Tesla FSD having um, longer miles between invention than human is the second quarter of next year. Uh, which means it may end up being the third quarter, but it's it's next. It's, it, it seems extremely likely to be next year. Sure, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, when measuring miles between critical interventions, um, yeah, like you mentioned, Elon, we already made a 100x uh, improvement with 12.5 from starting of this year, and then with V13 release, we expect to be uh, a 1,000x from the beginning, from January of this year on my production release software. Um, and this came in because of technology improvements going to end to end, uh, having higher frame rate, uh, partly also helped by hardware force, uh, more capabilities, um, so on. Uh, and we hope that you know, we continue to scale the neural network, the data, the training compute, etc. By Q2 next year, we should cross over the uh, average human minus for critical intervention, or like collision in that case. I mean that that is just um, unvarnished our internal estimate. Yes. Yeah. Um, so um, that that's not sandbagging or anything else. Um, our internal estimate is Q2 of next year to be uh, safe than human, um, and then to continue with rapid improvements uh, thereafter. Uh, so. um, wait, wait, to, to, now a lot. Uh, uh, um, 
vast majority of humanity has no idea that it does this by themselves. Um, so, especially for something like like a Model Three or Model Y, it looks like a normal car. So you don't expect a normal car to be able to be intelligent enough to drive itself. The yeah, Cyber Cab looks looks different. Cyber Truck looks different, but Model Y and Model Three are look. They're good looking cars, but look fairly, look fairly normal. So you don't ex expect a fairly normal looking car to have the intelligence, you have enough AI to be able to drive itself, but it does. Um, so we, we do want to expose that to more people. And uh, and so we're, we're, we're doing, with, every time we have um, a significant improvement in the software, we'll roll, we'll roll out another sort of 30 day trial. So to encourage people to try it again, and uh, and we are seeing a significant improvement in adoption. Um, so the the, the take rate for FSD is has improved substantially, especially after the 1010 event. Um, yeah, so so there's there's no need to wait for robot taxi or cyber cab for to experience full autonomy. We expect to achieve that next year with the with our existing vehicle line. Um, I want to actually spot someone gives a small taste of what it's going to look like um, the car able to drive itself to the user within private parking lots. Currently, it's speed limited, but then it's going to quickly uh, be increased. And we already had more than a million usage uh, items of a smart summon. Yep. So, um, and, and we actually we have um, for Tesla employees in the Bay Area, we already are are offering a ride hailing capability. So, so you can actually you with, with the development app you can request a ride, um, and it'll take you anywhere in the Bay Area. We we do have a safety driver for now, but the software required to do that. Um, We've, we've we've developed and I mean David, do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, sure, it's David. Um, we showed uh, some screenshots of this in the Q1 uh, shareholder deck, and um, yeah, this is real. We've been testing it for the better part of the year, and uh, the, the building blocks that we needed in order to build this functionality and deliver it to production, we've been thinking about and working on for years. Um, it just so happens that we've used those building blocks to deliver great features for our customers in the meantime, such as sharing your profile, synchronizing it across cars so that every single car that you jump into, whether it's you know another car that you own or a car that somebody's loaned to you or a rental car that you jump into, it looks exactly like yours. Everything synchronized, seat mirror positions, you know, media, navigation, everything is the same. Just what you would expect from uh, one of our robo taxis. Um, but you know, we gave that functionality to our customers uh, right now because we built it uh, intending for it to be used in the future. Um, releasing that functionality now. All the end-to-end -end cybersecurity that we knew we were going to need to deliver that functionality, um, sending a navigation to destination from your phone to the vehicle. Um, and so, you know, you're doing that now with the with the ride hailing app, but it's something that we've uh, made available to customers for years. Seeing the progress on a route in the mobile app, that's something you'll need for the ride hailing app, but again, we released it in the meantime. So. It's not like we're just starting to think about this stuff right now while we're building out, you know, the early stages of our ride hailing network. We've been thinking about this for quite a long time and we're excited to get the functionality out there. Yeah, and, and we do expect to roll out um, ride hailing in um, California, Texas next year to the public. Um, but not the California is somewhat, there's quite a long regulatory approval process. I, it shouldn't, I, I think we should get approval next year, but, yeah. but it's contingent upon regulatory approval. Uh, Texas is um, a lot faster, so it's. Uh, you know, I'd say like we're, um, we'll, we'll definitely have available in Texas, um, and probably have it available in, in in California, subject to regulatory approval, um, and then, and and maybe some other states actually um, next year as well, but at least California, and Texas. Um, so I think that'd be very exciting. Um, that's really a profound change. Uh, like Tesla becomes more than a sort of a vehicle and uh, you know, battery manufacturing company um, at that point. <clears throat> so um, we published our uh, Q3 vehicle safety report, uh, which shows one crash for every 7 million miles of autopilot. That compares to the US average water crash 
roughly every 700,000 miles. So it's currently showing a 10x uh, safety improvement relative to the US average. And we continue to expand our AI training capacity uh, to accommodate the needs of both FSD and Optimus. Um, we're currently not, not a training compute constraint. Uh, uh, that's probably the biggest limiting factor is that the, uh, the, the FSD is actually getting uh, so good that it takes us a while to actually find um, mistakes. Um, and when, when you start getting to where it can take 10,000 miles to find a, a mistake, it's a, uh, it takes a while to actually figure out which it is. Is this a bolt? Is this software bolt better than the software bolt A better than software bolt B? It, it actually takes a while to figure it out because neither one of them are making mistakes. But what takes take a long time to make mistakes. So that's actually the single limit, biggest limiting factor is how long does it take us to figure out which 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 version is better? Um, so that's sort of high class problem. Um, Obviously, having a, a giant fleet um, is, is very helpful for uh, breaking, breaking this out. And then with, with Optimus, we showed, we showed uh, a massive improvement in Optimus' dexterity and movement on October 10th. And our next gen uh, hand and forearm, uh, which has 22 degrees of freedom, double, which is double the, the prior uh, um, hand and forearm, um, it's, it's extremely human like. And also has much better tactile sensing. Um, it, it, it's really, that, that's, I feel confident in saying that we, we have most advanced humanoid robot by a long shot. Um, and we're moreover the only company that really has all of the ingredients necessary to scale um, humanoid robots. Um, because because the, the, the things that, that are, what, what other companies are missing is that they're, they're missing the AI brain, but they're missing the ability to really scale to very high volume production. Um, so, so you sometimes see some impressive video demos, but what? But they they like the they like the localized AI and the um, ability to scale volume to very high numbers. Um, as I've said on a few occasions before, I think Optimus will ultimately be the most powerful part. I think has a good chance of being the most valuable product ever made. Uh, for the energy business, that's doing extremely well. Um, and there's the, the, the off-shared ahead is gigantic. Uh, the Lathrop um, Megapack factory uh, reached uh, 200 megapacks a week, uh, which is now a 40 gigawatt, gigawatt hour a year run rate. And uh, we have a second factory in Shanghai that will uh, begin with a 20 gigawatt hour a year run rate uh, in Q1 next year, so just next, next quarter. Um, and uh, that, that'll also scale up. Uh, it, it won't be long before we're shipping 100 gigawatt hours a year stationary storage at Tesla. Um, and then it'll, that, that, that'll, I mean, I, that, that, that'll ultimately grow, I think, to, to, to multiple terawatt hours per year. It, it has to actually, in order to have a sustainable energy future. <laughs> if you're not at the terawatt scale, you're you're not really moving the needle. So, um, if, if you look at our admittedly very complicated uh, last master plan, <laughs> which I think actually has too much detail, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll ask Grog to analyze it and <laughs> shorten it up. <laughs> yeah, give, give us the TLDR on the last master plan. But we, we, we showed in that mass plan that it is possible to take all of Earth to uh, a fully sustainable energy situation uh, using sustainable energy power generation um, and batteries and electric transport. Um, and there are no fundamental material limitations. Like there's not some very rare material that, that, that we don't have enough of on Earth. Uh, we actually have enough of the raw materials to, yeah. Um, take all of human civilization, make it uh, fully sustainable. And even if civilization dramatically increased its electricity usage, it would still be fully sustainable. You know, what, one way to think of um, the progress of a civilization, this may sound a little esoteric, but is percentage completion of Kardashev scale. So Kardashev scale one would be you're using 
all the power of a, of a planet. We were, we're currently less than 1% on Kardashev level, level one. Level two would be using all the power of the sun. And level three, all the power of the galaxy. So we got a long way to go. <laughs> long way to go. Um, when you think in Kardashev terms, it becomes obvious that by, that the, by far the biggest source of, of energy is the sun. Everything else is uh, in the noise. So, um, so in conclusion, Tesla is focused on building the future of energy, transport, robotics, and AI. Um, and this is a time when others are just focused on managing around near-term trends. Uh, we think what we're doing is the right approach, and uh, if, if we execute on our objectives, and I think we will, uh, Tesla, my prediction is Tesla will become the most valuable company in the world, and probably by a long, by a long shot. Um, I want to thank the Tesla team once again for strong execution in a tough operating environment, and we're looking forward to building um, an incredibly exciting future. Thank you. Okay, well, where to begin here? Let me start with the mention of the new lower cost models. Yes, models, plural, set to go into production in the first half of next year. I'm going to take a pretty confident, educated guess here that it's going to be two. A compact sedan and a compact SUV, with the former probably being built on the Model 3 lines in Fremont and Shanghai, and the latter probably being built on the Model Y lines in Fremont, Shanghai, Texas, and Berlin. If it's more than two vehicles, I'll be blown away. I mean, because even launching two at once is something Tesla's never done before. And I know they did say, they didn't specifically say that they would launch more than one simultaneously. They didn't say they would both hit at the same time, but I think there's a decent chance they might, they're, they're gonna be unveiled together. That I'm pretty confident of. Hang on, the puppy, Daisy, she is scratching at the door. She does not like when there's a closed door between her and I. Okay, you're back in here, you're good. All right, getting back into the topic. So, uh, again, launching two cars at once is something that Tesla's never done before. I know that other car companies do it all the time, but I think it's fair to remind ourselves that Tesla is still a much younger company compared to literally any of the other major major automakers. But mark me down for a compact sedan and a compact crossover SUV as my predictions. I'll even give you price predictions. Why not? I reserve the right to revise these when I do my annual New Year's predictions on uh, at the very end of December, beginning of January. But... I'll give you some numbers now after thinking about this. I think the sedan will come in at $32,000 before incentives and the SUV 35 or less. And I chose those numbers because later in the call in a clip that I'm not going to play you because I I don't want to just play you the whole darn thing because otherwise well what purpose am I serving you here if I'm just repeating everything you heard on the call. But uh, Elon said in another clip, in another part of the call, that the Model 2.5 line, again, my word, my term, not his, that they're aiming to be, quote, under $30,000 with incentives with whatever vehicles the Model 2.5 line entails. So I think if you factor, if you start at 35 on the SUV, that gets you down to 27.5 out the door and 32 gets you to about 25 on the sedan. So that's where I'm hoping and kind of, that's where I'm guessing it's gonna land. Next, let's dig into that production volume estimate that Elon snuck in there. He said 20 to 30% vehicle growth in 2025. Now, I think it's fair to bake in a bit of growth on the Model 3 in 2025 compared to 2024 since the three fresh did spend a decent chunk of this year ramping up. And then the Cybertruck is also still ramping up as well. So if, to, if Tesla does deliver about 1.8 million cars this year, 
20% would be an extra 360,000 cars, and 30% would be an extra half a million, in fact, 540,000 cars. Given that the Cybertruck is likely to land in the 60,000 units produced and sold range for the year, give or take, that means the Cybertruck's going to add probably another 40 to 60,000 to that next year, maybe more. Let's just call it, for the sake of this thought exercise, 50,000 additional Cybertrucks next year compared to whatever they produce this year. Now, the Model 3, this one is a much less confident guess on my part. I will say an extra 50 to 100,000 Model 3s in 2025 compared to 2024. So let me just split the difference on that again for the thought exercise and call it 75,000 additional three freshes in 2025 compared to 2024. So between those two existing vehicles without factoring in the 2.5 at all, we're at an additional 125,000 vehicles of the 360,000 to 540,000 cars that Tesla would be adding next year if they grow 20 to 30 percent, leaving us with 235,000 to 415,000. That's the range. That's the range of number of vehicles produced across the Model 2.5 product line in 2025. Of course, I now need to start getting in the habit of referring to it as a product line until we actually learn the real names of these cars. So in about six months next year, that's what we're looking at, that it's going to add 235,000 to 415,000 cars in about six months next year. Now, even with Tesla using existing manufacturing lines and existing technologies, at first blush, I thought, well, that seems optimistic. But then I thought some more, like, well, wait a minute, does it seem optimistic? The Model Y does 600,000 units in six months, while the Model 3 does eh, half that, maybe even a bit less. But if the Model 2.5 line is two cars and not one, and they're being built on multiple production lines where Tesla already knows how to move pretty fast, well, okay, it starts to make sense. And the last time that Tesla introduced a car that shared a lot of technology and manufacturing process with an existing car in their fleet... Well, remember, that was the Model Y, and they ramped the Model Y quite quickly in Fremont and Shanghai. It took a bit more time to ramp the Model Y in Texas and Berlin because those were brand new factories. That will not be the case with the Model 2.5 cars. They will be built in existing factories that are already up to speed on manufacturing lines that are already up to speed. Now, while we're on the subject of vehicle production numbers, Elon mentioned in there 2 million robo-taxis per year when they're ramped up. Well, that would basically double the volume of cars they're producing now. And if the Model 2.5 line can add another 4 to 5 million on top of that, to be clear, Elon did not mention that four to five million number on this earnings call, but that's a figure that he has thrown out before. So if we take the optimistic side of that, five million, we are at nine million cars per year across the RoboTaxi, the 2.5 line, and the existing Sexy Plus Cybertruck fleet. But nine million still leaves us at less than half of Tesla's stated 2030 goal. But optimistically, or conversely, maybe another way, the way I'd look at it, put it this way, is it puts them right about where I have long said on this podcast would still be an awesome place to be, 10 million, even half of their goal by 2030, 10 million cars by 2030 would be pretty darn incredible. Now, my final comment on this 
on this <laughs> very, very thorough opening remark from Elon is with regards to the FSD ride hailing app. So cool to hear that Tesla's already got an internal development version of it that they're running right here in the Bay Area, which is not just where I live, but much more importantly, where Tesla's engineering headquarters is. So it's awesome to hear that they're that far along with it already. All right, let's move on to the shareholder questions. By the way, none of these questions, which are upvoted by retail shareholders like you and me on the Say online platform, you may have gotten an email from your whichever investment firm you're invested with that said, hey, you can go vote in this. But none of these questions, nor any of the questions asked by analysts, which hilariously, there were only there was only time for two analyst questions on this entire earnings call, which I think is the least amount of analyst questions they've ever had on a call. And I'm I'm sure the analysts weren't thrilled about that. But anyway, my point is Nobody brought up what I feel was the biggest question that needed to be asked in this moment in time. And that question is, why doesn't the Cybertruck currently get the individual $7,500 federal tax credit? Is it a simple procedure thing on the IRS side, meaning that the tax credit eligibility is imminent? Or is there something in the Cybertruck's 4680 battery cells that, despite the fact that those cells are made here in America, in Texas, disqualifies the truck? Be it minerals sourced from China or something like that. That was the question that I thought was the most important question of this moment right now, and sadly it did not get asked. Anyway, though, let's get to the questions that were brought up and addressed on this call. The first clip I want to play for you is in response to the question, when can we expect Tesla to give us the $25,000 non-robotaxi regular car model? So here's Elon speaking to that with Tesla's chief engineer, Lars Moravi, chiming in as well. We're not making it on... Yeah, and all our vehicles today are road yes, I think we've made very clear that uh, we're, 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 like the future is autonomous. Um, it, it, I mean, I, I, it's going to be, you know, and I actually said this many years ago, uh, but that uh, in, in my strong belief, and I believe that is panning out to be true, so it, it'll be very obvious in retrospect, is that the future is autonomous electric vehicles. Um, and uh, non-autonomous gasoline vehicles in the future will be like riding a horse and using a flip boat. Um, it's not that there are no horses. Yeah, there are some horses, but they're unusual. Uh, they're niche. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so it just, everything's going to be electric autonomous. Um, I think this, this is blind, like it should be frankly blindingly obvious at this point that that is the future. Um, so a lot of automotive companies, or most automotive companies, have not not internalized this, which is surprising, because um, we've been sh shouting this from the rooftops for such a long time, um, and it will accrue to their detriments in the future. Um, but all, all, all of our vehicles in the future will be autonomous. Even today? Yes, all the vehicles that we've, we've really made, all the seven million vehicles, the vast majority, are, are, are capable of autonomy. Um, and, um, you know, we're currently making on the order of 35,000 autonomous vehicles a week. Um, if you compare that to, say, Waymo's entire fleet, it's less than, a, they have less than a thousand cars. We're making 35K a week. Yeah, and our cars look normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they mostly look normal. The Cybertruck looks, yes. thankfully, you know, uh, look, looks abnormal. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the, you know, Cybercab slash robo taxi you know we, we wanted to have something futuristic looking and i think it does look futuristic um and it's, it's worth noting with respect to this, the cyber cab it's not it's especially not just a revolutionary vehicle design but a revolution in vehicle manufacturing that is also coming with this with the cyber cab uh the the cycle time like the, the um 
the units per per hour of of the cyber cab line uh, it is like this is just really something special. I mean, this is only yeah half order of magnitude better than other car manufacturing lines. Like like it like. Like, like, not not in the same league is what I'm saying. Not in the same league. Um, so, so it's 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 you know, and I I said like you know, several years ago that the maybe the most um, the hottest Tesla product copy will be the factory. You know, just like buy a factory. <laughs> um, yeah, you can't reverse engineer a factory. It's have to buy it. Yeah, it's like you know, if we can, yeah. Um, the, so the and and as we so we're, we're rapidly evolving in manufacturing technology. So um, so anyway, there's like basically I think having a a, a regular 25k model is pointless. Yeah, it, I mean, it would be silly. Like it would be completely at odds with what we believe in in, in an autonomous world. What matters is the lowest cost per mile of of yeah. of efficiency of that vehicle, and that's what we've done with yeah with the rope taxi. Exactly, autonomous. It, it, it's fully considered cost per mile. Um, is what matters and if you try to make a car that is um, you know essentially a, a hybrid manual automatic car it's it's, it's not going to be as good as a dedicated uh, autonomous car um, so yeah sour cab is, is just not going to have steering wheels and pedals it's fully designed optimized for autonomy um, it, no, it, it, it'll, 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 you know, cost on the order of cost, cost roughly 25k. So it, it is a 25k car, uh, and you can, you will be able to buy one on it exclusive, exclusively if you want. Uh, so just won't have steering wheel in the house. <laughs> you don't need it. First of all, I love the little nod to the Cybertruck being abnormal. Love that. Uh, second, I wanted to play this clip because of the comment about the comments on the CyberCab, both the design and the manufacturing. I just cannot wait to see this unboxed process in action. I mean, you know that Tesla is going to release a cool video of it once it's up and running and building cars at apparently ludicrously high speeds compared to other manufacturing lines. I do expect that we might not hear much more, let alone see anything for a couple more years because we got to it's going to be the robo taxi the cyber cab that that is the debut vehicle for this unboxed manufacturing process but it's gonna happen it is gonna happen all right the next clip i have for you is in response to an excellent question about not just the status of the tesla semi but also about the status of autopilot slash fsd on the tesla semi which as i've pointed out on the podcast before hasn't even been mentioned by Tesla since the unveiling of the Tesla Semi back in 2017, almost exactly seven years ago now. So here's Lars Moravi, followed by Elon. Sure, so as you, we posted in the earnings, uh, we're progressing swiftly on the build of the Semi factory in our, in, uh, in our data factory in Reno. Um, we've released all our major capital expenditures for that program. And we're on track to start uh, pilot builds in the second half of next year with production starting the first half of 2026 and ramping really throughout the year to, to full production. Um, Some of you know, growth will largely depend on our customers' adoption of the product. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I don't think we're going to be demand limited, honestly. Yeah, which I was going to say, which is like a no brainer uh, for, for the yeah. semi because it's really a commodity of total cost of ownership. Yes, exactly. It's, it's good. Uh, we, we have kind of ridiculous demand for the semi. Um, it, in that world where it's about how much do I spend to move yeah, goods it, it, exactly. cents per mile, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, f fundamentally, if, if you've got a semi where, where the fully considered cost per mile for, for a ton of transport uh, is better than, say, a diesel truck, uh, any company that doesn't adopt a, an, do an electric semi will, will lose. It's not a... It's not, it's not a subjective thing. It's like of whether do you like this competitive. I mean, we, we like we we want the style. We want we want to have a beautiful semi truck. But if, frankly, if we made an ugly semi truck, it wouldn't matter. <laughs> um, and, and this is proving so in our fleets and in, in Pepsi's uh, yeah, yeah. A partner. Um, in fact, the, the Pepsi actually said last week they're having nobody want their drivers don't want to go back. Want to stay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, as soon as we give anyone the, the electric semi, it, it's 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 like the that that's like the choice. 
yeah. it's the what they want to drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like, like so the like the most senior like the, their top drivers will they get to drive the Tesla semi. And it's the, it's, uh, it's it's the it's the thing they want to drive. It's 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 super fun to drive. It's also very easy to drive. It's easy, it's easy to drive and it, it holds ass. Yeah. It's like fast, yeah. super fast, uh, maybe too fast. Well, but I mean, like you, it, like you know, regular like these, like you've seen like the videos of where like I think like Tesla electric semi like you know can go uphill, speed, pass, pass yeah, it's speed, speeding past like the diesel truck, or even cars, yeah, even cars. Um, so it, like it's responsive. It, it's you 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 know you, you know. You floor it, and that that truck actually moves. But, and that's a benefit not only for for the driver and for the goods, but also for safety in terms of other drivers on the road. You don't get stuck behind the semi. You're not like yeah, you know, in a slowdown situation and on ramp. I mean, how that plays into you know FSD, which is the second part of the question. All of the semis have been since a couple hundred we've deployed already, and, and the ones that we'll be building next year and throughout uh, the future have all of the hardware and the cameras necessary to to uh, deploy FSD and we're currently training with that small fleet yeah. that we have. And as soon as the fleet is trained and the neural nets are up, you know, we'll, we'll get FSD onto that platform. Yeah, I mean, it'd be a massive improvement in uh, driver fatigue, you know, because uh, and driver safety, we've got sort of the anti jackknifing software. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're, you know, you don't have to worry about your brakes overheating if you go down a, down a steep hill because we use regenerative like that, that energy goes back into, back into, the, back pack. into the pack. Um, Actually, when we leave Reno, it's, it's just like it's it's like radically better than than a diesel semi. It's why, why the drivers love it. Yeah. Yes, finally, I'm so thrilled that we finally heard about FSD slash autopilot on the Tesla semi because the economics of the semi that's not new. We've been told about that. It's interesting. Don't get me wrong, but it's not new. And neither is Lars's update on the construction progress of the semi-truck factory at Giga Nevada. But the confirmation that Tesla and I guess presumably PepsiCo and any other company that's got a Tesla semi so far, the confirmation that the system, the FSD system is being trained for the semi right now is so, so cool to hear. And you know, Elon's absolutely right that FSD on the semi will yield a big improvement to safety with regard to driver fatigue specifically, just as FSD does for all of us right now, although the difference is those of us in in FSD and in passenger cars aren't necessarily required to drive thousands of miles a day for our jobs, whereas you are, or some, some people are in the trucking world, so having that driver assistance technology in those semi trucks is going to be huge. All right. I've got two more clips for you. The first one, bless the hearts of all the retail shareholders who upvoted this one. The question was, what is going on with the next gen Tesla Roadster? (laughs) Fun things. Well, I just have to like to thank our long suffering, um, deposit holders of the Tesla Roadster. Um, you know, the reason it hasn't come out yet is because it is the, it, 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 the roaster is not the, not just the icing on the cake; it's the cherry on the icing on the cake. And so, um, you know, our, our our larger mission is is to accelerate the progress towards a sustainable energy future. Uh, you know, try to do things that maximize the probability that the future is good for for humanity and for Earth. Um, and um, and so that necessarily means that, like the Things like that are kind of like dessert. We'd, we'd like, like, we'd all love to work on the Tesla, the you know, next gen Tesla Rose. It's super, it's, it is super fun, and and we are working on it. But 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 it has to come behind the the more uh, things, the things that have a more serious impact on the good of the world. Um, so just th- thank you to all our long suffering uh, Tesla Rose deposit holders, um, and, and and we are actually finally making progress on that, um, and uh, we're. we're we're close to uh, finalizing the design on that. Um, it's really going to be something spectacular. You know, for a friend of mine, Peter Thiel, uh, you know, and, and sometimes, sometimes people think of Peter Thiel and I are rivals. We're really good friends, um, <laughs> to be clear. Um, you know, Peter, you know, was lamenting uh, how, you know, the future doesn't have flying cars. Well, we'll see. <laughs> More to come. Yeah. 
Well, probably not a great sign for the release of the Roadster when the answer started with Elon and the executive team laughing. And when that's immediately followed by Elon thanking the long-suffering deposit holders, who I remind you put down either $50,000 for a general production reservation or $250,000 for one of the first thousand cars in the Founder series, and then immediately proceeding to tell them that the Roadster is a lower priority than all the other cars, which, on paper, yes, I of course agree with that. I've talked about it on the podcast before. But that one might not sit too well with the folks that gave Tesla a very large interest-free loan seven years ago, particularly when it's accompanied by laughter. You know, with Elon saying that the design work isn't even finished yet on the Roadster, it means there is zero chance, none, that the new Roadster goes into production in 2025, as he had hinted at in his last update on this on X earlier this year. So we are now out at least one more year to 2026, and we got another flying car tease, which I can't wait to see what that actually is. And to that point, I have absolutely zero doubt that the Roadster is going to be incredible. But the very fair question to ask, I think, is given, again, in response to what Elon just said, when will Tesla ever not have a higher priority than the Roadster? That's, I think, the fair question right now. It's been seven years. When will Tesla ever not have a higher prior priority? So... That was a disappointing update as far as I'm concerned, but I am nevertheless grateful to the shareholders for upvoting it enough to get it asked on the call. All right, the last clip I have for you is a notable one. So listen carefully to this. It affects many of you, myself included. It's about whether or not Hardware 3 will be capable of unsupervised FSD. Take a listen. As regarding the <coughs> hardware three, um, what we saw with 12.5 was it was easier to make rapid progress with starting with hardware four and figuring out the solution and then backporting it to hardware three instead of directly working on hardware three, given that hardware four has uh, more like fundamental hardware capabilities. Uh, I think that trend will continue uh, into the next few uh, quarters uh, as well, where we first figure out the solution rapidly with um, AI4 uh, and then backport it, write the kernels. It just takes longer to let up those things because it's not fundamentally supported in the hardware and it's emulated. Um, but yeah, it's initially working on hardware four, backporting it to hardware three. Yeah, so it's, I guess the answer is we're, we're not we're not one hundred percent sure. Um, but um, but but our, our as as a short mentioned, um, because uh, by by some measures hardware four has has really has several times the capability of hardware three. It's it's easier. To, to get things to work with hardware four, um, and then uh, it takes a lot of effort to sort of squeeze that functionality into hardware three. Um, and uh, you know, there, there is some chance that, that hardware three is does not achieve the safety level that um, allows for unsupervised FSD. Uh, you know, there's, there's a, there is some chance of that, um, and and if if that turns out to be the case, uh, we, we will upgrade those who have uh, bought hardware three FSD for free, um, and we have designed the system to be um, upgradable. So, uh, and it's really it's really what uh, you know, uh, just to switch to sort of switch out the computer type of thing. Um, the, the camera the cameras are okay, uh, you know they're they're, they're capable, but um, you know, we, we, we don't we don't actually know the answer to that, but if it does turn out, um, we, we'll take we'll make sure we take care of those who bought FSD on hardware three. Well, fellow hardware three owners, this is certainly good news. If Tesla cannot get unsupervised FSD running on our cars, they will upgrade them. And you know what? I got to give credit to Elon and the team right there because they were honest. They said they weren't sure yet if Hardware 3 was going to be able to pull it off. So I appreciate the commitment to the millions of Hardware 3 vehicle owners, even if only a fraction of those have purchased FSD, 
to make sure that we are taken care of either way. I mean, I know you could pick that statement apart in terms of timeline and this and that and, you know, the whatever you want to kind of dig into there, but the sentiment I believe is genuine and I believe them when they say that they will upgrade our cars if they have to. And again, this most companies that have media trained executives where PR people come in and they figure out exactly what they're going to say and what their exact message is going to be. It's one thing I've always appreciated about Tesla is that you will get an honest answer the overwhelming majority of the time because that answer right there of, oh, we're not sure yet if Hardware 3 is going to be able to do this. Pretty much, I would I would bet any other car company in the same position, they would not have said that. They would have said something like, well, we're, we're, in, we're investigating uh, Hardware 3 and you know it, it would have just been something some sort of corporate speak. So that, that was a pretty genuine answer right there. And again, I, my takeaway is the genuine sentiment. I believe them when they say that our Hardware 3 cars will get upgraded for free if that becomes necessary. All right, that's everything I've got for you from the earnings call. And then before that, the shareholder letter. I am not quite done with this week's podcast yet. Uh, I'm certainly running long enough where I'm not going to do your phone calls in the Ride the Lightning Hotline this week, but if you've got something to say, something in response to something I said or or a, a, something Elon or one of the Tesla executives said in one of the clips I played you, I welcome and encourage you to call in and leave a message on the Ride the Lightning Hotline, and I'll get to your calls next week. I absolutely promise I will get to them next week. So there are two easy ways to call in there. Uh, Either use your smartphone's built-in voice recording software, record your question, please try to keep it to 90 seconds or less so that I can get to as many people each week as possible, and email the file to me at teslapodcast at gmail.com, or you can call in and leave a message on the Ride the Lightning hotline. That toll-free number you can call anytime is 1-888-989-8752. Again, that's one 989 tsla Stick with me. I'm not quite done. I'll be right back with your pro tip of the week and a bit more coming up next. Hi, this is Franz von Holzhausen, and you're listening to Ride the Lightning with Ryan McCaffrey, the Tesla unofficial podcast. Well, as for what's going on with me and my Tesla, in this case, it's my future Tesla, the Cybertruck that I'm saving up for. I'm still trying to work up a big enough down payment. My goal is to try and get it by the end of this year, especially now that the referral bonus is there. So compared to just a few days ago, my future Cybertruck, again, if I can get it this quarter, just got $1,000 cheaper with that loyalty bonus slash referral. So that is good news. That really personally made my week. That was the the most... uh, The best news that I personally got this week in the world of Tesla. Hopefully it helps a number of you as well. I wanted to give you an entertainment recommendation this week, and it's a video game. It's for the MetaQuest 3 VR headset if you've got one, and that game is Batman Arkham Shadow. I'm still only like an hour or so in, but we gave it a great review on IGN over at my day job, and I'm really liking it so far. So. If you've got a MetaQuest 3, it, it, you can't use a 2. It's got to be the MetaQuest 3 or the 3S. But if you've got the newer MetaQuest, the Batman Arkham Shadow game, it is it is definitely worth your time. It's, uh, it is pretty fun stuff. They do a good job of translating all of the classic Batman Arkham game combat into the 3D VR space. So give that a look if you've got the MetaQuest 3 or 3S. All right. Time for a pro tip of the week. It comes from John in Colorado. Hi, Ryan. John from Colorado. Here's a response to your call out for pro tips. Uh, Here's one that worked in for me. Uh, I have a Model S hardware 4 that was overdue for upgrades, updates. Um, I am now on FSD 12.5 because of this. Actually got two upgrades in two successive days after weeks of not getting an upgrade. So if you go to the settings menu, you go to to software and scroll to the bottom where it shows you your software version, it will automatically check for an update. Um, And if there's an update there, it will 
within about 30 seconds is what I noticed. Uh, it'll automatically refresh and tell you there's an update and flip the little icon that says go ahead and download it. Um, so regardless of whether you're on Wi-Fi or not, um, I, I have premium can, premium connectivity, so maybe that has something to do with it. I also have advanced uh, software update preferences turned on, but I did that and got two software updates two days in a row after about three weeks of not getting any updates. Hope this helps. John, thanks for this one. I use this all the time, and this is one of those tips that I'm so personally used to that it doesn't even seem like a pro tip in my head, but it absolutely is, and to answer your question, it absolutely helps. I am happy to mention this to others who might not be familiar with this. I will add to this that I believe this trick only works once every 24 hours, and I think that change was made at some point so that people can't just keep hammering the Tesla servers trying to get the latest software update pushed to them if it hasn't already been pushed out to their car yet. So, John, I very much appreciate you calling in. And if anybody else out there has a good Tesla Pro Tip of the Week that you'd like to share with me and your fellow Tesla owners and enthusiasts, please do call in and share it. I would love to add to my own Tesla knowledge base and it would be great if you could help out your fellow listeners as well. You can send it in the same way that you send in the regular Ride the Lightning hotline calls, which I gave you the instructions for just a few minutes ago. I know this has been a long episode, but before I go, I want to mention some friends of Ride the Lightning that can hopefully help you out sooner or later. Starting with abstractocean.com, they've got a million great aftermarket Tesla accessories from lighting kits in, for inside and outside the car to the tempered glass screen protectors for your crucial center screen to just all sorts of great little things. My advice is to just go check it out. See what they got, abstractocean.com. If you like anything, put it in your online shopping cart. When you get to check out with everything that you love and have put in your cart, use the coupon code RTLPODCAST to get 15% off of your first order. That's RTL Podcast, all one word, no spaces. Meanwhile, the Snap Plate and Snap Plate Plus are available for S3, XY, and Cybertruck. And the folks at Every Amp who make this are now offering a nice little discount to the Ride the Lightning audience as well. So it's the front license plate bracket that'll snap on and off in seconds, but it's a nice, clean, minimalist design that blends perfectly with the Tesla front end when it's installed and leaves no unsightly hardware behind when it's removed. Make those fix-it tickets go away for those of you who, like me, hate using a front license plate, but either, but you just legally have to. So the snap plate is regularly the uh, crash the crash a sacrificial lamb, if you will. If it will, it will be destroyed, but protect your front end if, if you happen to hit something. The Snap Plate Plus is designed to be a little stronger, strength optimized with hardened features for maximum strength. Both are made from recycled, made in the USA plastics with stainless steel reinforcements. Get yours at everyamp.com slash RTL. And don't forget to use the discount code RTL as well. If you're in or going to be in the greater San Francisco Bay Area with a car that you love, be it your Tesla or something else, I wholeheartedly recommend that you bring that car to Immaculate Reflections. Super awesome detailer. Uh, It's kept my car looking better than new for the six plus years I've owned it. Whether you want to do paint correction to get the finish looking as good as possible, paint protection film on some or all of the car to protect said paint, and or ceramic coating so that you don't have to wax the car for the next three to five plus years. Any of that, all of that, whatever you want to do, Immaculate Reflections will take great care of you and your car. Check out the website, irdetailing.com. And when you reach out to contact them through the website, mention that you're a Ride the Lightning listener and any service that you have done will have the Ride the Lightning listener discount applied. The Patreon, I mentioned it a little while ago, but I would be so grateful if you would consider supporting the podcast on Patreon. Like this week's episode, it it takes a lot to put this together. I love doing it, don't get me wrong, but uh, I do continue to do this thanks to your generous support. So uh, if if you see it in your heart to support the podcast, again, 
every tier of the Patreon is ad-free and gets you early access to each week's episode. So the tiers start at just five bucks a month. If you step up to that $10 per month tier, that's when you get early access, ad-free, and those 117 and counting weekly lightning round bonus mini episodes. So head on over to my Patreon page to sign up or learn more at patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. If you're not already following slash subscribing to this podcast on your favorite podcast service, I do recommend you do that. It's totally free. What doing that does for you is it means that anytime there's a new episode, which is of course every Sunday at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific, you will get a push notification telling you that there is a new episode of Ride the Lightning. You won't have to remember your device and your subscription slash follow will remember for you. So I'm on all the major podcast services like Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Spotify, and YouTube Podcasts. The best way to search to find me on those in order to, to follow me and subscribe is to just type in Ride the Lightning Tesla Podcast, and I should should come right up. Uh, I mentioned the referral program earlier, so I won't hit that again. I will instead mention my social media accounts. I'm on X as well as Instagram, if you'd like to follow me on either of those. My username is the same on both, and that username is DMC underscore Ryan. You can email me anytime for any Tesla-related stuff. My email address is teslapodcast at gmail.com. Before I go, I want to say hello and thank you to the top-tier Patreon backers. I'll start with the top tier, the Roadster and Space tier. Big thanks to Pete White, Lyle Austin, Steve Radspinner, Fernando Cordero, Lawton from Chicago, Sean Neidig, Neil Weaver, Jackson Wallace, Rolf and Jennifer Evers, Howard Anthony Smith, Victoria Iacovetto, Tesla Hitchhiker 42, Carol Weston, Robert from Near Philly, Kristen Rumble, American Home Contractors, GetAmber.com, Doug Carey, Rav, and Michael Gallo. Next up, the Maximum Plaid backers. Thanks so much to Jonathan Wales, Cameron Clark, Daniel Grummer, Seth Capello, Nick and Tony, The Galpin Family, Ryan from New York City, Darren Nickel, Kaz Barnes, Brett Libano, Patrick Wisniewski, Gil Cabrera, Todd Badger, Joe Edgel, Kevin Yank, the Tesla Owners Club of San Joaquin Valley, Will Stedman, Justin Perez, Jeremy Harris, Chris Beach, Tom Mills, Corey O'Donnell, Aaron, John Cody, Joel Sapp, Paul Casarino, Richard Corley, Chris Osborne, KB, Adam Lavoy, Jason Chalukas, Travis Krenzel, Bruce Otterstein, Tom Behan, Josh Pennington, John from Creamridge, New Jersey, Dustin Hart, Derek Finley, Charles Clement, Adam Christie, Damon Klein, Jeff Brown, and Jerry Slinger. And finally, a big hello and thank you to the grandfathered-in Plaid Level supporters. They are George Cassioppo, Logan Willis, Peter Chalet, Eric Randolph, Dory and Steve Guberman, the Tesla Owners Club of Taiwan, Ron Lee, Charlie Gillespie, Jeff Angwin, Chase Cabanillas, The Lydia Family, Aaron Altschul, Jared Brown, Jerome Strack, Jamie Dalton, Mike and Barbara from Louisville, Matt Nixon, The Tesla Owners Club of Wisconsin, Ish, Not Elon Musk, Peter, and The Bear Boys of Colorado. That will wrap it up for... As expected, a long episode of Ride the Lightning, the quarterly earnings call shows usually are. Uh, I only played, I think it was five clips from the earnings call. Usually it's 10 or 12, except the difference was one of the clips was 21 minutes long. So I uh, hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I had fun putting it together. I do enjoy doing these. It's, it's a little nerve wracking because it's always a sprint. Because the week doesn't really, I can't really work on the podcast until Wednesday when the earnings call happens. But it's a sprint, but I'm always, I always have fun doing it anyway. And when the, when the podcast is done, as it now is, oh, it's a nice relief and it feels good. And I get to upload it 
Get it out to the Patreon backers early. Get it out to everybody else on Sunday at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific. And hopefully all of you enjoy it. Thank you so much for your time, your attention, for your shared enthusiasm with te- uh, for Tesla, I should say. And with that, for a uh, yeah, snoozing Daisy the Boxer, my name, of course, is Ryan McCaffrey. Happy electric motoring, my friends. And I will see you next week. Elon Musk, people don't like Elon Musk. The guy founded PayPal and Tesla, and people are like, yeah, but he's a troll and a bad dad. I'm like, so was mine. He did nothing to fight climate change. (laughs) Also, have you been in a Tesla? Have you been in a Tesla? My buddy let me drive his Tesla. I laughed out loud at how fast it went. Been clinically depressed my entire life, on dozens of medications, in a Tesla for 13 seconds, cured forever. I mean, I think a Tesla is the most fun thing you could possibly buy ever. That's what it's meant to be. Our goal is to make, it's, it's not exactly a car. It's actually a thing to maximize enjoyment. It's maximum fun.